Hello and welcome to Doubles and Trebles. It is the time to go through the final runners and riders for Arc Day. There's going to be six Group 1s, an extravaganza of top class flat racing coming from Paris Longchamp on Sunday. We're recording on Thursday afternoon. We're going to be the first ones up, I think, with our preview and selections. And you've not only got the delights of me this time, we've got Andy Humphrey back on for his annual appearance on the channel. Um, or Hump, as I'll be referring to him as in this in this video and throughout. I do not know an Englishman that loves French racing more than Hump, so he's the perfect person to have on. He'll be providing plenty of insight, particularly on the French form, which I generally don't have much of a clue about. So we're not messing about with any niceties, Hump. Who wins the main event on Sunday, the Arc de Triomphe, and why? Yeah, hello, everybody. Nice to be back again. Um I'll give you before we get into the main bit. I'll just give you give you a couple of notes. I'll put down first. The biggest field since '94. Uh, there's been no back-to-back cult winners since the legend in '78, which was a great Vincent O'Brien. Uh, and then yeah, we'll get onto this a little bit later on, but uh, it's not been the greatest hunting ground for the Japanese, as we know. But my uh, my winner, uh, I've got down as uh, I've got it down as Onesto to win this year, to win the Grand Prix uh, the Grand Prix de Paris winner. Uh, it's a bit of a hot and cold horse. He wins, then he loses. He wins, then he loses. But obviously, had a nice prep run the, uh, to start the year before winning the winning the Grafoy over there in France, which was which was a good win. Um, the draw was against him in the Prix de Jacques Club. He was never in it. He was at the back the whole way around. You'll see that in a lot of his races. To be fair, he uh, he gets anchored out the back, and the eventual one two three with the ones and the one two three basically throughout the whole race. Um, it was a bit dicey for him in the straight as well. Ancient Rome seemed to have a magnet in his saddle and he just kept drawing to him the whole time, coming in, coming out, going in, going out. And then well, well gave him a bump just to finish it off as well. So it was a pretty rough day for him. The Grand Prix, as I mentioned, was a big win. Um, some good winners in there. Some names that people will know. Obviously, El Bodigan was in behind. The Ledger winner, Eldar Eldorov, was also in there. Uh, Sim Camille was in there as well. And he's, uh, Stefan Vatelson and him over to the Japan Cup. Um he won the Niel, which is the trial for the arc as well. So, and he recorded a really, really fast uh, 400 to 200. I think it was just near, it was near 11 seconds, so it was right on the money. Um, he's um, he's been given some absolutely dreadful draws in France this year. He's really, really had a hard time. So, in the Fontainebleau, there was 10 horses in that. He was he was uh, in stall nine. He was six of six in the Grafoy. He was 14 of 15 in the Jockey Club, and he was five of six in the Grand Prix de Paris as well. So he really, really hasn't a uh, he really, really hasn't had a lot of luck now. He was given draw eleven for the um, for the arc this time around. That was done this morning, which is a fine draw for me. It's perfect, right in the middle of the field. He can um, he can go forward. He can stay back. The likelihood is they'll probably put in the anchor on him again. Hopefully not too far back because there's a couple here, especially the Japanese that are likely to go forward. Um, the owner does a lot for the game as well. He's a Gerard Augustin He's a he's a big player in France and. I think he I think he's the one to he's the one to watch in my opinion. I think he's the one with who could improve past his last run. Obviously we saw him in the Irish champion last time around. He was uh, beaten by Luxembourg, which was which is what it is effectively. But at the prices, you know, he's eleven, twelve to one, I believe that I can see at this moment in time. And I think he's probably gonna be the one that I'll be looking to on the day. Um I don't know what your thoughts are on Ernesto. Spectacular start hump because we've not teed this up at all. And I think Ernesto is without question the best value in the market. 14 to 1 best price. That is a standout with one supplier. Um, and four places each way is going to be available generally. Um, yeah, I'm, I love virtually everything you've said there. Um, hump. A winner of the Group 1 Grand Prix de Paris over course and distance in July. As you know, I always question the, the French form on the face of it like that. But the second that day, um, Sim Camille. Um, if I'm saying that right, won an official arc trial on his next start, the Prenial. I think you've mentioned that. The third that day was second in the French Derby and a Group 1 winner last year. The fourth that day won the St. Ledger on his next start. There won't be many French Group 1s with better form than that um, this year, that is for sure. Um, you touched on the Irish champion. That was his most recent start where Ernesto was second behind Luxembourg, up with the pace, battled on quite well over a trip that's too short for him. I think that, that was over 10 furlongs. I think he's going to be better over 12 and has proven to be better over 12, if you see what I mean. Um, beautifully bred by Frank Call out of a season the stars mate. there is plenty to like at 14 to 1 I really I really do like him and he's I think he's the best value on offer at this stage we've spent many a video on this channel looking at the arc so it's only right that we kind of conclude conclude my thoughts uh, really at this stage um 
I've been banging on about Luxembourg. Yes, we are on at 20 to 1, but new viewers won't want to hear me talking about a 4 to 1 favourite that we're on at 20 to 1. So I started a really completely fresh look this morning in preparation for this. I landed on Ernesto, as I've already said. Um, starting with Luxembourg, he is good. I really like, I do like him. I do worry about him staying 12 furlongs. This will be his first try at it. No horse since 1990 has won the arc on the first try at 12 furlongs. That is a big concern. Um, a concern for most of these as well if, is if there is any more rain. I'm sure you can update me on the weather shortly. Um, Luxembourg, you could argue, has got the best form in the book. That Irish champion was a cracking race. Five of the rivals from that race will face again in the arc this this weekend. So we've got a, you know clear form lines there of how they did against each other. Um, that was some performance, really, given that Luxembourg was off 100 days um, in the height of the season. He did have a comeback then into the Irish champion. Is he a leading contender? Absolutely, yes. Am I backing him at four to one? No, is the answer to that. Um, next in the market is Alpinista in the region of 11 to two. She'll certainly get the trip. Most underfoot conditions will be fine for her. It's just a question of quality. Is she good enough? This is really the deepest water she's ever been in. Six to one, 11 to two. She's not for me. So Corto Tasso has been has been given a nightmare draw in 18, um, really wide. But he's the one I've struggled with the most. I don't know whether I'm for or against Takoto Tasso. I think I've probably landed on being against um, last year's shock winner at 72 to 1, as we've covered on the channel previously. Um, I really liked his performance in the King George at Ascot in July. That was on ground that was way too quick for him. I thought that was a quite nice visual performance. Um, there were some bad failures in behind him, which we'll come on to. Um, the form is questionable. Mishrif missed a break badly. Three-year-olds, Emily Upjohn and Westover, bombed out really badly. Um, but it was visually really quite encouraging. He then took in the same prep as last year, the pre uh, pre von Baden or whatever it's called in Germany, uh, back on home soil at Baden Baden, a joke of a Group One, really. Let's be honest, four runners, a tactical affair, poor in quality. Um, he went off odds on and, and and was beaten ahead in a messy race, particularly up the straight. That form wouldn't fill you with confidence ahead of this arc, but of course it, it goes without saying that you know bad grounds fine, the trips fine. We saw that last year, but. I'm not with him at 15 to 2. I'm against. Westover, I've got no interest. I thought the Irish Derby form is is absolutely terrible and he's as low as 10 to 1. How he is a shorter price than Ernesto, I do not know. Vidani, I think, wants faster ground and he's unlikely to stay, in my opinion. You might disagree with me there. Um, so I'm ticking off quite a few and I'm, you're asking me where's the where's the actual selection. Well, it is Ernesto. I was going to get there. You beat me to it. I do really like him. Um, I'm just going to, before I go on to, I've got a long shot as well, Hump. Um, before I go on to that, have you got any comments on the likes of Vidani? Um, the, what I would say is it's Jean-Claude Rouget once again providing providing the goods for the French. There's pretty thin on the ground after that. I think he's I think he's had a super year. He's been a fantastic colt to watch this year. Between the jockey club, going to Sandown and then obviously... Uh, it was an odd, I thought it was an odd run in the in the Irish champion. Why assume I went down that rail? Only he will know. I think a lot of people he kind of deflected a bit of blame from himself on that, but I think he was I think he was the, the problem there from that kind of point of view. Um the form of his French runs have worked out okay. A few group wins in there, of course, obviously he beat Ernesto in the Grand Prix who won the Grand Prix de Paris. Um so going back to the Irish champion, I was actually watching the RTE coverage that day. And Sumion did, and this is the direct quote, said, the good thing is at the end of the race, he showed he could stay a little bit longer. The track was a bit soft, and I think with a clear run and a bit more fitness, I'm sure he'll be able to beat them, talking about Onesto uh, and the guys at the front. Now, the bit, the problem there is the track was a bit soft. I think if he's going to, if he's making that comment about Irish Champions Weekend, where we know Leopardstown drains like a colander with extra large holes in, he's going to find it heavy going this week. And um, I don't think... I don't think he'll be in the top three. I think he might struggle to make the top five in all honesty as well. The pro my problem is I really want him to do well for the trainer and just the balls they've shown this year to go through with it. Uh, but he's coming up against proper 2,400 metre horses, 12 furlong horses in the biggest race. It's it's a big ask for a three-year-old. And I, I agree with you. I'm not sure that he'll want the ground the way it is. What I will say and potentially to look forward to is I think they've done right by swerving Baid. I don't, I don't think anything will beat Baid. But I'm not sure if they should have. I'm not sure if they're using this as a stepping stone potentially to a Breeders' Cup turf where the ground is going to be better. They did the same with Tarnawa. Obviously, it wasn't. It was Dermot World last year, but Tarnawa ran in this, then ran in the Breeders' Cup turf afterwards. So it could be a way that they are now 
potentially seeing how he goes here with the potential to take him over to the Breeders' Cup where we know the ground. I think it's in Kentucky this year again, so the ground isn't going to be isn't going to be an issue for him there. But on the day, like I said, I'm a big fan of the horse, big fan of the way he's been campaigned, big fan of the whole team behind it, the Aga Khan, George Rimmel, the team. But I really think he's going to struggle in this race. It's really, I, I just can't see it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm against him and I am for Ernesto. My secondary selection, um, I looked at this race as a fresh this morning and I didn't even know this horse was running, Mostadaf. Um, I honestly wouldn't have even guessed he was he was running. He's 40 to 1 each way, four places. Uh, he's another mm-hmm. Frank call, like Ernesto, out of a Debar we may. I, I thought this Mostadaf was better than ever uh, um, on his last start in a Group 3 at September Stakes at Kempton. It was on Sprint Cup Day. Me and you were there at the Sprint Cup and we kind of like, this went under my radar and I'd not even watched the race back, actually, until this morning. I thought he absolutely dominated the race at Kempton, scooted clear. It's the deepest renewal of the September stakes I've seen for years. A race in which trainer John Gosden has used for a prep for Enable en en route to the Ark twice. This Mostadaf gave £3 and a beating to Dubai Honor, who is a genuine Group 2 horse. Um, Dubai Honor has been as high as 121 officially. Um, Mostadaf slammed him out of the way. He was into second. There was other decent Group 2 slash Group 3 yardsticks in behind, beaten by Miles. Solid stone, gear up, third rail. I just, yeah, I just was surprised that Mustardaf was such a big price for this. He's had two tries on soft ground in his career, at very much a lower level. He's won both of them. He's obviously going to have to produce another career best, but to get anywhere near winning this, but he's certainly better than 40 to 1 odds suggest to me. He's actually 50 to 1 with three places each way. So keep an eye on the markets for your place terms. But I thought he was, I thought he was a real contender. I thought he should be. Off the price, I think he should be twenty-five to one, not forty. And as we say every week on this channel, it's all about price. I don't know if you had any thoughts at all on him, Hump. Uh, I, I didn't really look into him, to be honest. I think I think you've made a very really good case from there. You know, from that kind of point of view, I think oh, going back to what you were saying before, I think if you're looking for one for me that will fill that will fill in, you know, fill in the top three, then I think I agree with you on Alpinista. Um, I think she's I think she's a really good chance. But we said this last year when we were talking about Town Out when it stands again this year, another year on. There's been no five year old mayor winner since nineteen thirty seven. She is a five year old mayor. Now, whilst she's been campaigned superbly throughout the year by Sir Mark Prescott, um, she you know, she's she's definitely gonna like the ground, she's no issues, she's won pretty much in everything from good good to soft, soft, good to firm. Uh, there's no problem with that either. Um, I had a look into Luke Morris's stats around around France, around Paris Longchamp. He, it is a bit of a worry. His last ride around Paris Longchamp was three years ago, which was also, again, on Alpen Easter. Uh, but his last one was back in 2017. And this is no slight on Luke Morris, and it's just the way it's the way he rides. But I think if there's going to be a problem, if there's going to be an argy-bargy interference throughout the race, which in this kind of race there is, you knowing a lot of the time, they open that two-metre rail, obviously the cutaway. But his, I'm not sure that the French will be favourable to his style and the way he rides, because I think he is a very, he's very actionable. He's got a, a very uh, exaggerated action, let's put it that way. And he looks like he comes down quite hard, up and down, quite hard on the horse. So I think if he gets into a bit of that, I think they could hold that against him. Um, but overall, I think she's, I think she's, I think she's a great, great one to be in the top three. And what, what also is a big help is, um, you know, she's been in decent sized fields. She likes to have horses on her inside. So from her draw. You know, from her drawing six, she's going to have at least five horses on her inside as well, which is good. She's very versatile. Doesn't matter. Doesn't really matter. Like, um, doesn't really matter what comes to her. I think she'd be in the top three. Going to your talk, hey, to Tasso. Uh, it's still bananas what happened last year. Absolutely bananas to think about where we come into the race and this is a horse that I know a couple of people tipped and fair play to them for finding that because when we did this last year, I don't think we even spoke about him. So more fool us and that kind of thing. But a um, Fine runs to start the year, Group 2s, uh, not Mickey Mouse's, but obviously he won one. Uh, the only problem from here is he has been running in small fields, which hasn't been great. Um, he ran well behind uh, Pile Driver at Ascot, left Mishrif Westover, as you mentioned, chasing his, chasing his backside, which is good. And we have to remember that he was drawn out on the wing in last year's arc as well. You know, he was very wide there, still managed to come down and win. Um, the one thing I did notice watching it back was he did, he did end up in the middle of the track. Now, if it's going to be wet and it's going to be a bit sloppy in France, the chances are they're not going to be much. 
action down the middle of the track they're going to hold the far side rail so he could come onto the fresher ground on the near side potentially but that ground could also be a bit softer in the middle because obviously where Paris long it might sort of drain into the middle so we'll have to watch that back see where they run um see where they run on the day obviously he's got the Tory on the Tory on which is a, a huge help for him you know it's a really really huge help um but going back to it I just something just doesn't feel right to me about it this year. I just don't think he can go back to back. Like, and we mentioned a legend, I mentioned a legend at the start of the year, at the start of the year, at the start of the, start of the recording. So it's going to be difficult for him. And I would also agree with Westover with what you said. I think my, I wrote three words down for Westover, which was just move on. <laughs> yeah. And we will be moving on very shortly from the main event. But yeah, to Corto Tasso, I fear him, but I can't be with him. From, from, a, from a betting perspective. So, anyway, that's the main event all wrapped up there. We've covered all sorts of horses. Um, away what, from what, I will, what I will say is, for the Japanese horses, I know people are talking about the Japanese horses, but look at tight holders specifically because he's the best of, he's the best of him, without doubt. Um, he's, got the, he's got the train track form, so he's got all the ones on the board. Um, he's not at a trial race, which is different to what the French, with the French to what the Japanese normally do. Um, but they have been poor in the trials, so that could be... A bit of a blessing in disguise, really. Uh, the jockey had a spin round Parry Longchamp. Um, he finished last in a race earlier on this month, but that just read into that what you will. The thing that stood out for me for the there was a connections quote on Joe de Gallo not that long ago. We said the ground is a question mark, the weight is also a question mark, as he's never carried more than 58 kilos and he'll be carrying 59 and a half in the arc. So people can read into that again what they want, but for him to not have that weight, not carry that weight, I think that's going to be um. I think that's going to be a bit of a shock to him and I think it's just it's the same story every year you know if we're there if I'll be there on the day so I'll be a witness to history if it happens if it doesn't we just take another year in the box and say well what can they do again next year but um yeah I think I think for, from that kind of point of view it's uh it's going to be interesting to see how they fare and it's just one one more thing to add on this obviously there's been a lot of kickback recently with a very elegant saga I know you mentioned it on an earlier podcast this week obviously she was she wasn't she wasn't going to get into the race so the the connections took her out put her in the opera instead um the field size is it has been a bit unfortunate for connections but again at the end of the day and it was mentioned on the nick Look podcast the other day rules are rules and if there was to be you know a fatality in the race and they'd up the races above their rules it could be an absolute car crash for france gallo it could be a car crash for the connections and the trainer it just it's not as it's not something that i think they were ever going to bend to and I think they've done the right thing by doing that. Like I said, it is unfortunate she can't run in the race. It's also unfortunate that La and can't run in the race because I think she would have been a contender as well. But I think it was it was refreshing to hear a trainer like Raffard speak so openly and honestly, wouldn't it? Look, it's just one of them where it's just an unfortunate situation. And we'll, I'm sure France will take a lot from it, but it's um, it's the right thing to do. And uh, hopefully she'll run a big race in the uh, in the Royal Year on Saturday anyway to make up for it. Look, if there was good enough hump, they'll get in. They've just not performed well, well enough to get in. It's as simple as that. It is a little bit intricate and complicated for, for me to be commenting on them. But yeah, if there was good enough, they'll get in. Um, away from the main event, we've covered all sorts of angles there. There's another five fantastic group ones on the day um, at Paris Longchamp. Hump will be there. Going back to chronological order, um, the Jean-Luc Lagardier, uh, 115 UK time, two-year-old Colts, mainly Colts, but Phillies come. I think there's one Philly in it as well. Over seven furlongs, group one. Plenty of home team representation here, Hump. So, uh, where are you, what's you thinking on this one? Yeah, there is. A, it, it's a good. It's a good lot of races, actually. It's not. We're used to bigger fields in these in these kind of races. It's just a shame that we haven't. Obviously, we haven't got this that this time around. Um, I'll go straight in with my winner. I think Shartash is going to win if he runs. Obviously, these are not final decks. The final decorations for this will take place tomorrow. Um, I think Shartash is the best chance of winning. Um, we look to. Look back at his form. Um, it was supposed to be Aesop's Fables in here. He was entered, but they've now pulled Aesop's Fables out, which is, you know, which is a bit of a shame. But he um, he ran against Little Big Bear. He got thumped by Little Big Bear, but I don't think I think everybody has that's run against it so far this year. He finished just behind Persian Force, who who I think is quite a talented horse, and he was making ground on the um, on Persian Force at the end of the race. He obviously beat Brad Sell in that same race, um, and this was over. I think it was at the Corridus as well. So. Brad Sell obviously won at Royal Ascot, which is good. Um, and he was going through the line really, really quite nicely. And as I said, he didn't lose much to Persian Force that kind of way. The time before that, he beat Blackbeard and he absolutely cruised through that race. Ben Cohen had him in a perfect position. He pulled him out to the middle of the track and he beat Blackbeard, which now 
going back to it, it looks looks pretty spot on. Obviously, he, I think he was at the middle park. He won obviously at the start of the, the end of last week. So I think the form is hugely in the book for Shartash. That kind of point uh, from my point of view, I've sort of fused all of the French horses together. Uh, so Tigre, GameStop, and Breeze Sky. Um, Start with Tigre. Tigre was obviously is trained by Christopher Head, who's who's really super. He's a really super fellow, super trainer. Obviously, uh, we know Freddie's dip. Freddie's dipping out at the end of this year, so the head name will carry on through Christopher, which is good. Uh, what Tigre won the last time out. He beat. Uh, he beat actually beat GameStop and Breeze last time out, but GameStop that day broke horrifically, reared up basically, and was given no chance. Was behind, lost a good three four yards at the start. They tracked each other throughout the race, and um, and the. Um, He's, he's not too bad. He nicked it from under the nose of, of Bree Sky, really. Bree Sky went from the front. Um, the ground was a lot better that day, unfortunately. It's going to be this day. Uh, none of them will have gone anywhere near ground like this, which obviously is not great coming into it. Um, I'd look into the pedigrees, and the one that I put, the one that's likely to get away with it is, uh, is GameStop. His dad was a solid performer on soft ground, but he's by Lope de Vega, which obviously doesn't bring much, you know, from that kind of point of view. Um, I wrote down about the Antarctic. At, before we get into the Antarctic, just to get into it. Aiden O'Brien's not won this race since Holy Roman Emperor. And that is <laughs> it's before I started watching racing a long time ago. And he normally targets, if we're being honest, he normally targets his best at Newmarket. He will go for the Dewhurst, obviously those kind of races. Um, but he he did have St. Mark's Basilica down to run this race in 2019. Now, obviously, we, there was a bit of the feed fiasco that year where none of Aiden's horses run. Um, and he has others he run in this race recently, Broom, Armory, those kind of horses. So solid horses, but I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go mad for it. Um the Antarctic's been a bit of a workhorse for him this year. He's been sort of his sort of his yardstick, really, I guess if you want to put it that way. He's had eight runs. Um and he ran in the middle park, so I'm not hundred percent sure. I think I think he ran in the middle park anyway. I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah, we're second that he'll last actually week. running this race. So I'm not actually sure that they'll back him up for this race, which would be interesting because it means they then don't have a, a runner in a, one of the biggest two-year-old races, but I put him down anyway. Um, I don't think I can't, you know, after after running last week, if he runs again and wins, it'd be, you know, it'd be an Ian O'Brien training performance, another another box of tricks that he pulls out. But to go back to it all, I think Shartash is, is going to be my winner. Johnny Murray to Raga Khan, get her off to a good start. And probably, wanna, probably a big one for Ben Cohen as well, if he gives him the ride. But again, these are not final declarations, so... Hopefully we see him in the race because we can't afford to lose too many more from this race. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so yeah, the arc is the final field, but all the other races finally declare on the Friday. But I can't see too many changes from the runners and riders that we have now. Um, yeah, Shortaz is 11 to 4. I was looking at getting with him, Hump, to be honest. He ran a nice race in the national stakes last time over seven furlongs. He was third that day. I didn't know if he was. I, I don't think he's bred for the job to to be stepping up to a mile. I thought he might. You know, seven was stretching him. I think a mile was certainly stretching him. And to, 11's four favourite here. I think I've got to be. I've got to be taking him on. I don't know a whole lot about the opposition. Well, you've got to remember the lagger there is seven furlongs. The lagger there is not a mile at seven furlongs. So sorry, that, but even that's even what... that, even that, yeah, uh, yes, it is seven furlongs. But even that, I'd. I, I don't know if he was, I think he wanted to go backwards rather than forwards in his last race. But if, if you ask me, Aidan O'Brien, as you mentioned, usually has the favourite, doesn't often win it. Um, he's got the Antarctic here, who might well run uh, fresh off um, being second in the Group um, Group 1 Middle Park Stakes last, just last Saturday. That was over six furlongs. This is seven, as we've mentioned. But let's not forget, this horse, the Antarctic, is a full brother to Batash. Now, he couldn't walk seven furlongs, never mind racing it. So... You know, he's he was he op- he was actually six to one after this morning's uh, declaration stage. Now into uh, four and shorter. He's, he's favourite with some the Antarctic, but I'd be I'd be against him. Um, yeah, it's a no bet from me. Um, we, we're uh, we're breezing over it really quite quickly, but yeah, it's uh, telling that that someone like yourself who follows the French form is is keen to get with with a non-French runner, even though, even though they've they've uh, got plenty of numbers in this race, but maybe not the quality. Um, moving swiftly on to the Boussac, which is over a mile hump, We're only recently quite changed. Um, main, uh, this is for the Phillies only. Quite a big field at the moment. Um, might might be trimmed a little bit tomorrow. Um, yeah, I've uh, there's a, again plenty of uh, French runners. Um, I just wondered what your starting point was for the uh, Marcel Boussac. Yeah, uh, this uh, three were put into the Boussac today. Uh, so we had two French horses coming, and then 
We also had uh, Fuzzy, uh, one of the stack runners, came in, Aspen Grove. Uh, so the, the field has changed a little bit. My um, the favourite at the minute, I believe, is Kalina. Uh, Kalina's been on a, a bit of a tear, really, to be honest, this year. She's she's been arguably one of the most exciting French fillies, you know, in her two starts. She's won by six six lengths combined. The breeding lines are really strong with her as well. She's her page includes with you, call the wind. So from a from a mile point of view, she's got Frank, obviously she's by Franco, which is a huge plus. Um the form of the first win is it's been okay. Horses have gone on and won. Um the second the second of her races was basically a trees race, all being told. But she still put her head down, even though there was a lot, you know, even though she knew they were probably inferior to her, she really kept her head down, really pushed her through the line, which was really good. She handled the ground at Shanti as well. It was it was quite poor that day, which is a good sign. Um, and her action's okay. It's not sort of Bruce Lee kicking it up, you know, getting her knees up really high, but she's she should be fine on the ground from that kind of point of view. I think she will appreciate a good pace, though, and with so many runners being in the race currently, I think you probably are going to get a good pace from here, which is which is good, and I wouldn't be surprised if she was really at the front, really at the front of the van. Um, she's only had two runs, so she could be, as I mentioned, she only had two runs, so she could be a little bit keen, but um, Carlos Lafampaya, her trainer, um, actually won this race in 2010 with Silasol, um, and he ran Silasol, not at the same meeting, but it was around the same kind of dates when she won that year, so it was around the se- September the 10th, September the 9th, so he's followed his path, you know, obviously, as, as trainers do, creatures of habit, Um Guillaume was very sweet on her by all accounts as well. They've had a couple of really good two-year-olds, so Left C, Precious C, and Kalina being the top three. Um, but this apparently was his favourite one, so it's good to go. Um, I think she she could be the likely winner, but I'm leaning more towards Blue Rose Sen. Now, obviously, we mentioned Christopher, I mentioned Christopher Head before. Um, I mentioned Christopher Head before when we were talking earlier. Um, brings the Parry Longchamp mile form into the race. Obviously, that that's what you want. You want the course and distance form there. Uh, when it was the pre dome all as well, which is a recognised trial. She beat a few UK horses that day as well, and that doesn't often happen, as, as you'll be a testament to put into my case every single time UK horses go over and win races. Um, you know what you're probably going to get with her. She's likely going to go from the front as well, which on if it's brown, if the ground's going to be pretty bad, that's where you probably want to be at the start. You don't want to be hanging around at, out the back of the telly. Um, and a lot of Christopher Head and the Yaguda, um, Yaguada, sorry, Yaguada Centurion horses go forward, which is nice. She's just got an action that looks like she eats up the ground as well, which looks really, really good. She's got a really good stride length, and she she went a gallop that day. I don't think many of the others could, and she just went longer, harder than they could as well, which was really, really impressive from my point of view. She was beaten at uh, the time before that, but in a listed race. But the winner has gone what has gone on and uh, and won a Group Three. Um, she looks really comfortable at a mile. I think that's what I'm most looking forward to. She's really good, comfortable at a mile, um, and she would be my winner. I was. Now I know we were looking to we were looking into other horses. Um, I actually wrote down about Be Happy. Now Be Happy, unfortunately, was scratching the race this morning. It looks like Never Ending Story is going to go instead. Um, obviously, that the one thing that screams Never Ending Story is obviously the uh, the Tahira run. Uh, she ran it. Obviously, she was in that race. She was well beaten, but she wasn't really pushed. It was almost like sort of a bit of a bit of a comeback, a bit of a prep run in a way. Uh, but they really raced her again. We mentioned it about the Antarctic early run. She's had six races this year. Six races for a two-year-old filly for Aiden O'Brien. You don't really see that quite a lot. Um, the former of her wins is, you know, when she's won, is, is amounted to zero. If we're being completely honest, it's not really that very good. Um, and the dam side of it all probably would prefer better ground. Um, so whether she gets it or not, I'm not too sure. The last thing I noted down was she ran in the, obviously she um, she was a participant in the Moyglare. Bally Doyle run, uh, ran in the Moyglare before this race. Uh, found running the Moigle before this race as well. So, you know, they they both didn't actually win uh, here at the Moigle, and neither did she. So she was fourth, found was third, and Bally Doyle was oh no, Bally Doyle won it, sorry. So she they followed the form in a way um from what's happened in the past, but I I, do, I just don't I don't see her to be honest. And then a good judge, a good friend of mine, Jordan Hopkins, quite likes uh, Habana in this race. She's twice raced. Group three winner in a second start, but she's coming from Germany, you know, it'd be it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for them for a likely horse race to win. Uh, likely horse, likely raced horse, if I just put my teeth back in, to win this race. But I think um my winner would be Blue Rose Sen. Well, Hump, we agree again, which is 
<laughs> particularly given that this is a French horse. I can see why Kalina's fav. She's she's had two two runs full of potential, but really nothing more than novice company in UK terms. Um, but yeah, I thought Blue Rose Sem would be much closer to favoritism. Yet I looked at this race with no with no prices, and I thought she would be close to favoritism. She's actually available at seven to one. Um, uh, yeah, it's a case of form book versus potential. Blue Rose Senna is the best form to date, particularly from the French contenders. There's only two horses in the field that have achieved an RPR of 100 or more to date. Uh, one of them is Wed, who was put in this morning, and the other one's Blue Rose Sen. Second in a Deauville listed race by a short neck. The winner has since won a Group 2. Then on a most recent start, she won a Group 3 over course and distance and was really quite taken that day. I thought Blue Rose Sen, as you said earlier. Um, I'm surprised she's 7-1. to one. Um, I mean, she's beautifully bred, Kalina. But seven to two in a race that is basically a first time out of novice company. Wasn't sure it'd be a small, small bet for me, given I don't know a whole lot about the French contenders on Blue Rose Scent. Um, in terms of the UK and Irish runners, never ending story. You've mentioned a fourth, but a mile behind Tahira and Meditate in the group three. Um, uh, sorry, in the group one, Moigley last time, um, a group three winner before that. She's been busy, but hasn't really uh, shaken up, shaken up the world, in my opinion. We don't have a clue how good she is. And she's five to one. Um, Ralph Beckett sends over Dandy's Ali's um, on what we, what could be a big day for him and the team. Um, we've got the, uh, Kim Ross later on we're going to come to. Westover we've touched on. Jumping from a sales race to a group one is a big ask. But um, I do think that Cora sales race is good form. Is it group one? I don't think so. That's why um, Dandy Ali's um, is 20 to one for the for the UK representatives there. But yeah, we're both on uh, Blue Rose Sen, six or seven to one in the market hump. I like it. Um, moving one, to, one, well, one thing to mention with Wed is who was put into the race. Um, she did actually beat Never in the Story as well uh, in the Prix de Calvados, which is a Group Two. Um, that was at Deauville, but she uh, she finished about two two and a bit lengths ahead of her that day as well. So, from our point of view, that's just you know Never in the Story. It stacks. It's starting to stack up against her, unfortunately. Yeah. Next up chronologically is the arc, but we've already covered that in full. So we're on to the pre de l'Opera um, for fillies over 10 furlongs. A massive field for this race, in, uh, as, as, a, as far as I know. 16 runners, there could be all sorts of trouble. Um, I think it's quite straightforward to me, for me, to be honest. Um, I'm all over Nashua. She's 9-4. to four. I love her. I think she has been drawn wide. You will enlighten mm-hmm. me on that in a, in a moment or two. But I've just loved Nashua all season. Um, this race is perfect for her. I'm sure it's been the plan for some time to come here. You, the same comments wouldn't apply to a few of her market rivals. I just think she's quite simply better than the likes of Above the Curve, La Parisienne, Tuesday, Maestro, all of them. Um, she's drifted to 9-4 to four on the back of that draw that hasn't been kind. But this is her trip. It's her race. Um, genuinely soft ground is OK, but wouldn't want it terribly worse than that. She's improved with every run this season. Very much campaign for the race. Off since Goodwood at the end of du- July, where she quite simply never looked like getting beat in a decent, half decent renewal of the Nassau Group One at Goodwood. It's all about Nashua this race for me. Uh, yeah, the first thing the first thing I wrote down was where's the pace though? Where is the pace? Because they're all likely to be able to. Nashua can go forward, but you know it's a big field, but it doesn't seem to be a huge amount of pace in it, which is. Tuesday, if she runs, could maybe go forward. That's that's what I was looking at. But um, I've been an Ashwa fan. Like I agree with you, and, and I think she is our winner. So we're, we're three for three at the minute. I think at this, or is it four for four? Um, three for three, I think. But yeah, but she's been super, really, really super this year. Like I said with Adani, I think she's, you know, she's really taking everything on. Really tried, really giving it everything, 100%. Um, she travelled really well. Won the Diane, uh, pretty Diana earlier on this year. Uh, got the better of La Parisienne then that day. Obviously, La Parisienne tried to catch her late, uh, couldn't get there. She opposes again, obviously, as we mentioned, missing out from the arc. Um, again, stood up well, you know, at Goodwood. Beat Aristia, who then went on and won the Prejean Romane at Deauville. I was there that day. Um, Richard Hannon was uh, not very forthcoming where Aristia goes next, but she he, obviously she doesn't appear here, so she must be going to ask it or she'll be left out for the rest of the year. Uh, Lilac Road. Also ran that day. She never really lost in the Bermai. Dream Loper, who won the Mulan, was behind her that day as well. So the form has just really, really turned out great. Um, she's been off for a bit longer potentially than we, we would have expected. I thought she may she may have come back for come back for a race in between, but obviously she's she's probably going to be fighting to get back on return. Go, I don't have a I don't have a problem yeah, I, with John Gostin. Yeah, I have got a point on that. On that. I have got a point on that one. Being off the track since July the, the 28th, yes, um, it's going to be 66 days, but she wasn't, she's been kept to her own sex and there's not been um, another, you know, 
very suitable for her against her own sex. She could have ran in in the Judmont Bayid. She could have ran in the Irish Champion again, open to the open to the males. I just think this has been the plan for a long time. Um, yeah, I'd, it's all about Nashua. This is for me. She's not actually even t- that far clear on on ratings um, as I look at it on Racing Post. But I just think she's. I just think she is. I, I think Holly Doyle's perfect for her. I think, that, like I say, it's the right trip. Ground should be okay. Um, I just think she's better than these, and she's she's dominant. She's got. There's more to come from Nashua, and that's pretty scary thought given that she's won um, two Group Ones there uh, back to back. Yeah, I think I think the only one possibility is the ground. Obviously, John Gosling has spoken about the ground, and we're not going to know obviously what it's going to be or how she'll handle it. But that is that you know we'll get to that when they come to it. I know um, just to skip through the others. I know you mentioned above the curve, uh, no ground issues with her because she is just an absolute tank of a filly. She looks huge. And if you see her on the telly, obviously, obviously she was beaten as a shorty at Chester. Uh, but the best of them lose at Chester. That's nothing to hold any, nothing told against anybody. Obviously, swerved Epson went to the Allery. Uh, but the form of that's not really worked out from our, our point of view that great. And they, um, uh, it's the same for the core really. Last time, she obviously second ran behind Luxembourg, close to the Royal Whip. La Petite Coat always threatened to be a good horse for the, you know, has been threatened to be a good horse all year, but really hasn't been it since the Pretty Polly. She's likely raced, which is good for her. Um, but I just don't get the vibe from her, to be honest. I just don't think she's got enough speed. I think Nashua's, Nashua seems quick. She looks quick. Above the above the curve might eat up the ground a bit better than Nashua, but I don't think she's as quick. And I think that if they let Nashua go from the front, which they could potentially do, it could be a pre de and all over again. It could be basically a, re, a start stop replay. She's she could be go, she could go, she could not come back to them. Um, La Parisienne, uh, unfortunate midweek. We mentioned that about that in the past, but we won't go back. We won't go back over it. My problem with her is she just doesn't win. She doesn't win. She's got a and she hasn't won since April. Now she does not say she's not a bad horse. It's just not no arguing to the fact. Look, she she hits places every time, which is really admirable from our point of view, and comes within the neck of two good horses in the last two runs. But you build confidence upon success, and there's not been really that much success. Um, I, I'm not overly and Peter Bradley and the and his team have stuck with Gerard Mosse. They've stuck with him throughout the season on it. But I think for a race like this, I just he wouldn't be my first choice. And I know it'd be rude to jock him off, but he wouldn't be my first choice. I was reading back and, you know, you're looking at it and he rode in a, he rode in the arc before I was born. That's how long he's been <laughs> running at the game for, which is unbelievable. Um, <laughs> so, so for me, if if it was me, I'd, I potentially would have changed the jockey. Um, but obviously they can't, the likelihood is they're not going to do that, which is which is fair call to them. Uh, she's a hurricane run there. Um, a hurricane run. She's out of the line of hurricane run. So it's all she has it all in pedigree as well. Um the one I don't know how to pronounce this horse. It's Jesse Harrington's horse. It's won twice at Dover. I think it's called Trevenant or Trevenant, something like that. They put her in this morning. Uh she won in the last two outings to France. Um she beat sort of UK Irish horses the last time Cecil Grove was in behind her that day and Rosa Seal won a grot uh, earlier on in the year as a French form line. Uh Agave also ran in that race who finished behind Ernesto. In the Griffo, but that was like you said, it was a small in the race at the start of the year. Um, from her, from Trevenance's point of view, the breeding didn't mind the soft, they put her in at price as well. Um, but this is a proper set of group one horses if we're talking about it. This is a really good set, so I'm not 100% sure on her, but yeah, my winner, an agreement with you is uh, <laughs> is Nashua. Three from three, even the dog agrees with that uh, selection. Yeah. But on their tre- that Trevenant, um, 16 to one, and like you say, I think um, Harrington is really shrewd. Um, and to be to be put in and supplemented for this, I think is a sign in itself. Right, two races to go. Just stop. I'll answer the door if you pause it. Yep. Just let it ride. I'll just let it ride. Yeah, that'll be two minutes. Pump's gone to the door. Always professional on doubles and trebles, as you can see. Um, but yeah, onto the um, Prix de Labbe over five furlongs, a five furlong sprint that often throws up some mad results over the years. One of the strangest group ones in the calendar. Ran miles away from the actual track at Longchamp, uh, from the actual um, home straight or the stand. It's in the middle of the track, like being at Sandown. Draw bias galore over the years. Um, UK and Irish represent 12 of the 18 strong field at the moment. Final decks on Friday, which is pretty standard for this race to have plenty of um, UK and Irish reps. Um, fast two-year-old, very fast two-year-old, the Platinum Queen is the 11-4 to favourite 
but I've got to take her on. I really have got to take her on. She actually ran better than I thought she would at Doncaster last time. I took her on that day. She was second, um, but it's clearly old enough form pretty well. Um, carries less weight than everyone else being a two-year-old. Um, but I've got to look elsewhere for value. I really have. I think she's better on quicker ground as well. Um, Hump's back with us now. Uh, yeah, I'm taking on the Platinum Queen Hump in the Abbey, but there is plenty of um, French and and other countries um, represented towards the top of the market, which is, you know, unusual, let's say. Um, they're, not the, they're not the strongest of sprinting nations, the French. Um, but yeah, I'm taking on uh, the Platinum Queen. I haven't told you who with yet, but I'm going to speak to you first. Oh, sprinters, middle of Paris, middle track. Just, I gave a crazy bit of thinking last year. I think I said just to pick the, whatever finished the one, two, three in the flying five, I think it, whatever that was. We actually got there with a case of you did actually win the race didn't you last year. So, well, I picked uh, it last year, Hunt the case of you. He did, that is correct. But I, I, I'll i be honest with you, I, I'll be sitting down and watching something else on my phone while this race is on. But if I was to pick one, I'd stick with what you know, stick with the form. But again, we mentioned this last year and it's all about the draw. You have to be low. If you're high, if you're out on that wing, you've got no chance. You need, you know, everybody comes down the rail. You need to be low, need to be low. Um, obviously, we don't know what the draw is at this moment in time, which is unfortunate, but whatever comes out. If a case of you is drawn low again, I would be going for him as my pick. But I think that I'm more than happy to allow you to uh, to to go ahead on this one. No, well, we're almost, no opinions. We're almost four out of four, Hump, although that was a very tentative selection from you. Um, I put up a case a year last year and he won. I see no rise, reason why he can't go close again. He's 10 to 1 currently, may well change up on the draw, get, get bigger or shorter. Um, he's had a disjointed European flat season with just three starts. He was at Maidan earlier in the season. Um, but two of those three starts in Europe have been over six furlongs. He clearly prefers five. He got no way near Highfield Princess in the flying five at the Curra last time. But I do think he was on the un unfavourable far side of the track there. Nothing got into it from the far side. No one was beating Highfield Princess, don't get me wrong. But nothing even threatened the places from the far side. A case of you and Romantic Proposal were on that side. Romantic Proposal was scratched this morning, unfortunately. I was interested in, in that one as well. But yeah, a case of you, I, I would happily back at 10 to 1, depending on the draw. I'm also putting up another Irish horse. Um, Castle Star is 25 to 1 and I'm almost certain friend of the channel SD will also back this because he is very uh, loyal to Castle Star and um, 25 to 1 another that's had a disjointed season but was unlucky in the um, aforementioned flying five at the Curra behind Highfield Princess last time now look he wouldn't have won but it would have been much closer than eight if he actually raced on the same side as Highfield Princess on the on the near side with a clear run he would have been much closer than eighth um, off 57 days before that run which was only his second of the season. So clearly, you know, he's been hard to get right this season, Castle Star. He had a really promising juvenile campaign, three-year-old now. But hopefully that flying five runner's put him bang on for a crack of this. He's usually patiently ridden. So that's not ideal for the Abbey. Let's let's have it right. But, um, you know, he's going to need plenty of luck in this five furlong dash. But Castle Star, 25 to one. I'll be having two bullets in that race. Um, and that's, that's the way I'm playing it. Um, Pumps obviously got very little opinion on, on this sprint race and sprint races generally. So we'll swiftly move on to the final group one of the day, the Prix de la Foray, the only group one over seven furlongs in Europe. Um, Kim Ross is the favourite. Um, there's no getting away from that. He's six to four. I don't think I've ever backed Kim Ross. Um, much to my downfall in recent, week, recent weeks as he's won back-to-back -back group twos at York and Doncaster, producing career best efforts in the process, particularly at Doncaster three weeks ago where he carried a penalty against a, a decent field and still won quite easily. Um, he's clearly thriving at the moment. He's rightfully the six to four favourite. Um, can you see past him, Hump? He is very short. Sure. That's what I will say. You you kind of have he look. I put very short at six to four. However, looks the one to be, and Frankie will no doubt ride him for Ralph Beckett. Um, one thing I will say about him, he looks versatile. That's what I will say. And I think in the in, I think in the seven furlong race, you have to be versatile. Uh, so he can be at the front, he can be in the middle. So depending upon how the race goes, he you can put him. Frankie will know he can put him in the race, and he'll run his heart through seven furlongs. Obviously, as you mentioned. Um, Group is it looks as there's certain horses that fall into that seven furlong categories and obviously last year we we mentioned space blues we just just you could back space blues blind over seven furlongs basically and he looks like one of these that kind of just if it's not seven furlongs he he hasn't got a chance um city or park stakes as you mentioned a lot of them have been they've been beating up on each other so sandrine new energy they kind of come up against each other all the time which is 
which is fine. And whose turn will it be this time? I I looked elsewhere, and I don't know if you've, I don't know from that kind of point of view whether whether you want to move on. And I I picked Tenebrism. I, I think she's if she runs, I think she would be the winner for me. I think she's she had an up and down year. Um, obviously she was the favourite for the Guineas and, and finished nowhere in the Guineas. She was nowhere against in Spiral at Royal Ascot, but again, not many people were. But then she came out and she won the Jean Pratt, which was which was unexpected from my point of view. I think she was about five to one that day as well. So I was very shocked to see that happen. And uh, she beat a few of those that are in here today, obviously, Aka Carbon, New Energy. And obviously, Modern Games come out of that race as well and won recently at Woodbine. I think it was in the Woodbine mile that he run. So the, they tried to put her back up to a mile. She kicked off again. She couldn't get near Saffron Beach and then Pearls Galore. There was, not, there was nothing there as well. Um, <laughs> she's unbeaten at seven furlongs. She's tried it once. She's won once. So... She's unbeaten at the distance, and this could be her optimum. So if we stick with her, um, I don't think we'll go far wrong. She, I think she is a proper seven furlong course. Uh, she's out with a mortal verse as well, which is fine on soft ground. Won the mile while as well, a mortal verse won the mile while. What I will what I will say is, I don't think Aidan O'Brien's ever won this race, so I think to do it with ten. Yeah, not many runners nice. to be fair. No, he doesn't run many in it, but at the same time, there's not many there's not many group races in the world that Aidan O'Brien hasn't had the winner of. It's in continental Europe, you know, so. <laughs> that is that is of interest. Um, I don't know if you want me to skip through a couple of the others or if you want to chime back in. That's completely well, up to you. I'm going to chime back in, Hunt, because you've put, forget the Abbey, you've put up four bets and all four <laughs> of them I agree on, right? And I've not teed this up at all, have we? This is pure, nope. like, you know, coincidence. Nope. Tenebrism has to be the one. I've got to be with Tenebrism. This is the perfect race for her. I said it weeks and weeks ago on, the, on this channel. Five to one. She's running five consecutive Group 1s this year, which is admirable for a, for a three-year-old filly. She's running nothing but Group 1s this year. Four of them have been over a mile. She's not won. Got close a couple of times. Close-ish, second, third, fourth. One, one of those races has been over seven furlongs. And guess what? She won that one over seven furlongs. That's the only win this year she's had is over been seven furlongs. I don't know why they've been so insistent to keep trying at a mile. She doesn't stay a mile. I said I was saying this six, seven months ago on the channel. She went off favourite for the 1,000 guineas, does not stay a mile. Group one at Deauville in July, um, she won that. I've been saying all year that they should be over shorter than a mile. They have persisted. This is the perfect race for her. Um, she'll need a career best to beat Kim Ross, no doubt about that. Um, and I do think Kim Ross is the one to beat. It's a bit short for me to be saying this, but I would back Tenebrism each way happily. No problem at all at, f at five to one. No problem. Um, and get me money back it, it, as and when she places. Look at that form from the pre Jean Pratt. You've touched on it, Hump. You've took all basically all of my content that I was going to say. You've said it. Modern Games, second to Bayed on his next start, then won a group one, which isn't the best of qualities, but easy as you like in Canada last uh, two weeks ago. E couldn't have been any easier. New Energy. Um, uh, was in behind them um, in the Jean Pratt that day, got to within a length of, of Kim Ross last time at Doncaster. Light infantry, beaten a neck on his next start in a group one. Um, the Jacques Lamar, I think you've mentioned that one as well. That's good form. She needs to be at seven furlongs. This is the race for her. The only thing I do fear for Tenebrism, she's had, it's been quite a long season for her, as I've mentioned. She's had, she had the first group one was on May the 1st. She's basically not had any time off group one, May. Middle of June, middle of July, 2nd of August, middle of September. She had a group one basically every month of her life this year since May. Um, that would be my only niggle. But Aidan O'Brien, if he thinks she's fit enough to run, fit and well enough to run, I'm going to trust him five to one each way. That would be my bet. Yeah, I, th I, I agree with everything you just said. Um, just, just to spin through the others, um, Sandrine is interesting. Andrew Baldwin doesn't send runners to France very often. His last one was actually at Maison Lafitte, and Maison Lafitte's been shut down for a couple of years now, so that tells you how long it's been since he had a winner there. Um, another seven furlong specialist. You know, she won the Lennox at Goodwood. We can't ignore the fact that she won the Lennox at, uh, the horse won the Lennox at Goodwood, beating Kim Ross on that day as well. So yep. you can't you can't get away from that. It uh, could be the one to lead. It, you know, there could be the pace in here. But she could be the pace. Um, the ground looks a bit of a no-no, to be honest, but she... Uh, the Albany was one on heavy ground, but that was two that you know be getting on for nearly a year and a half ago now. Um, needs to find seven pounds with Kim Ross, unfortunately, on official ratings for with Tenebrism. I wouldn't be overly confident in that. On um, there was one of interest on the outside that um, she's been a bit of a been a bit of a focus horse for me this year, and that's Malavath. Malavath has been a bit of a strange one to be honest because they've come in and they've had a 
really, really high hopes for Malabar. Um, and she's she's not really performed the way they want, really, to be honest. Um, she beat Zelly uh, at the start of the year, which was, you know, which is which, you know, Zelly won the um, Zelly won the boost at the year before, which was great. And it was, <laughs> you know, they've been it's the same thing what they've done with Tenebras and they've been up to the mile. They realised that she can't win at the mile, so they tried to come back down to the seven furlongs. And really, what I think she needs, I just think she needs bad ground, to be honest with you. I think she needs that bad ground. She beats Ellie on heavy ground. Um, and I think this might now have come and turned around to it. The runs where she's not performed have been on good, good to soft. She's been a lot of dancers, and it's, it's been a pretty big season for her as well. But I think she'll be alive in each way chance if she goes and she gets the ground. Um, two more. Uh, Mangostine won the French Guineas which was completely unexpected. <laughs> and she won the grot before that as well. Um, they came to Ascot, but they, they got, like everything else in that race, they got whacked by um, they got whacked by Inspiral that day. Back down to seven furlongs, you know, she didn't do much against Tenebrism at Deauville in the Jean Pratt. Um, but they've given her a huge break. And I think that's going to be interesting too. And Mikel Dazong doesn't often, you know, give his horses like mega breaks. Uh, not his good ones anyway. But she'll be fresh back for this, which is going to be good. Um, one thing I will say is uh, the ground could be key for her again. So I'll keep her on side as well. These are all French horses that are probably going to be quite big prices on the day because obviously if, if we do stand all of the English and Irish horses, you know, Kim Ross, Tenebrism, Sandrine, you know, New Energy, they, they're likely to be shorter in the market than the French horses. And one last thing is I'm not going back to the Akakaba well. We put her, we put her up to win the Lager there last year. She was fourth for that day but has done the absolute square root of nothing since then. She's been beaten by all of the above horses that we've spoken about, and she needs to turn it around ultra sharp as if she was to get anywhere near winning this race. Yeah, Malavaf 12 to 1, as you mentioned there, Hump. Um, Mongerstein 16 to 1, and Akakaba is 20 to 1. I've probably said that last name wrong. But before um, the builders come through that wall behind you, Hump, with the drill, we've rattled through all sorts of races there. We agree on most. Um, we'll wait for the final fields tomorrow on the supporting races. Then they will be in the description at the prices available tomorrow morning. Um, we're on Ernesto, both on Ernesto at 14 to 1 for the OC. That is the final field. You can take that price now. But other than that, Hump, how would you wrap it up and say, what's your biggest fancy of the day? Forget the prices. They'll be confirmed tomorrow. Which horse are you most confident of winning on Sunday? I will go with Tenebrism. Tenebrism is going to be... Tenebrism is going to be the nap for the day. I think this is the race they want for her. This is definitely the best race that she needs to be in. As we mentioned, I'm beating at seven furlongs. I mean, it's only one race at seven furlongs, but that is what we're all about. I think the the, the next best would be Blue Rose Send to win the Boosak. I think she's got a really, really good chance, and especially if they employ the tactics that they've done so far. Send her from the front. Make sure she goes from the front and see if anything can catch her. Kalina is probably going to be in behind, but I think Blue Rose Send is going to be the one. And then if Shartash goes... It'd be in order of those, it'd be the one, two, three. I think Shartash shall win the lag of it if he goes. Great. Hump's going to be there on Friday. So big thanks to Hump for, for filling in there. We've gone through all the races. We're coming up to about 50 minutes worth of uh, worth of recording there. Um, I'll put Hump's uh, Twitter in the description as well. Well worth following for official aficionado in, on all things French racing, not just Art Week, all year round. So uh, big thanks to Hump for, for that. And um, yeah, we'll crack on and let us know your best bets in the description, in the comments below. And we'll be back soon with more content. So thanks very much.